All right, I think I'm gonna start broadcasting. Um, we're gonna wait uh, maybe one, two more minutes to let people join us. Okay. And then we're gonna start. Yeah, I can see people joining, that's good. I'm gonna mute and, and unmute as, as uh, we get called on, so. Actually, Stephanie, you're you're fine. I I don't hear any buzzing uh, from your. You were worried about your computer, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I I think you're fine. Okay. Uh, folks are just joining in, and we're gonna give them. We're gonna give everybody about a minute or so more. Dr. Trujillo, are you in your office, sir? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I am, it, it might be good if you just all unmute, unmute, so you can, in fact, just chime in anytime. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You, you too, Vince, if you just wanna un unmute yourself. Uh, I know, it. yep, thank you. I, I know Vince is a three-year-old and a five-year-old. And... So if I mute, you know what's going on. <laughs> uh, let's wait one more minute and then uh, I think we'll start. All right, I think we're about to start. Um, all right, perfect. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, happy Tuesday. It's, uh, it's, the weather outside is really beautiful. It's, uh, I, I guess you can call it the mini summer, you know, the, um, the, uh, the eve before hell. <laughs> and, uh, but enjoy the weather. Uh, it's been really nice the last couple of days. My name is Luigi Del Puerto. I'm the associate publisher and editor of the Arizona Capital Times. Of course, the Arizona Capital Times covers state politics and state government. And if you don't have a subscription, please let me know. I'll get you squared away. Um, today, we're going to talk about the future of Latino education um, before, during, and of course, after the pandemic. Uh, but first, I want to thank our sponsor this morning, a new group, Arizona for Latino Leaders in Education, or All in Education, aims to ensure that the communities most affected by education uh, inequities are the ones making decisions for all children. All in Education seeks to serve as a clearinghouse for Latino educational incubators and current research on the opportunity gap faced by the Latino community. It also seeks to identify and develop leadership among parents and students, existing elected and appointed Latino leaders, as well as future leaders, including political candidates, board members, and appointees. All in Education will soon release the findings of its outreach to parents and educators uh, through discussions on community forums about the needs uh, during this pandemic and perhaps beyond this pandemic as well. Um, I wanna thank again All in Education for sponsoring this morning's forum. Our panelists this morning uh, uh, include um, let me back up a bit. We have a powerhouse panel this morning. I'm very thankful for them joining us. Um, we are going to learn a lot from, from our panel. Uh, we have Superintendent uh, Kathy Hoffman. Uh, Kathy Hoffman, of course, is the State Superintendent of Public Instruction. She was elected in November 2018. She has spent her entire career working in public education, first as a preschool teacher and then as a speech language pathologist. Uh, she began her career in the Vail School District in Southern Arizona before joining the Peoria School District. Her experience as both an educator and advocate for students with disabilities informs her vision for public education. Throughout her career, she has fought tirelessly for equal access to high quality public education, regardless of a student's race, gender, or zip code. She asserts that only through committed investment and inclusive policies can bring Arizona um, can Arizona bring its public schools from the bottom to the top of the nation's school system? Uh, Superintendent Hoffman firmly believes that, of 
course, Arizona's future starts in our schools. Also joining us, Kathy, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, good morning. And uh, Kathy, uh, you're, you're learning, you have a sewing machine now, right? <laughs> yes, I just bought a sewing machine. <laughs> awesome, uh, enjoy it. Thank you. Um, also joining us this morning is Dr. Gabriel Trujillo. Uh, Dr. Trujillo is the superintendent of Tucson Unified School District, Southern Arizona's largest school district. A lifelong educator ending his 20th year of service in public education, Dr. Trujillo uh, started as a teacher at both the elementary and secondary levels in the areas of English as a second language and English language arts. Later, he moved into school and district level administration. Served for 10 years at the Phoenix Union High School District, where he was recognized as a Rodell Foundation Exemplary Principal Finalist in 2014, and was awarded the Phoenix Union District's Administrator of the Year in 2015. He accepted his current position as Superintendent of Tucson Unified in 2017, where after only his first year of service, the district demonstrated impressive academic gains as a quarter of the district schools increased their letter grades for the 2018-2019 school year. Dr. Trujillo is a graduate of Arizona State University where he earned a master's degree in educational supervision and leadership and a doctor of education in educational leadership and policy studies. Uh, Dr. Trujillo, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, good morning. Thank you for having me. Are you in your office, sir? Yes, yes. Perfect. Um, also joining us this morning is Stephanie Parra. Uh, Stephanie is the executive director of All In Education. She is an educator committed to improving public schools in Arizona. A first-generation American citizen, Stephanie was born and raised in Yuma, Arizona, and is a product of Arizona's public schools. As one of the first in her family to attend college, Stephanie saw firsthand the importance of education and the wonders it can do to develop a child's life and future. She holds about two bachelors in justice studies and psychology, as well as a master's in higher and post-secondary education. Her passion for education led her to pass roles at Teach for America, Arizona State University, T.W. Lewis Foundation, and the Arizona Education Association. She currently serves as the governing board president of the Phoenix Union High School District. Uh, she represents Ward 3. Uh, she is passionate about ensuring every, ensuring every student in Arizona receives an excellent education and is adequately prepared to succeed in life, uh, in college, or in their careers as well. Stephanie, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Are you just at home, ma'am? I am at home, yes. Perfect. And uh, finally, we have Vince Yanez. Uh, Vince is the Senior Vice President of Arizona Community Engagement at Helios Foundation. I'm sorry, Helios Education Foundation. In this role, he leads uh, Helios staff engagement with the community and stakeholders to improve quality access and achievement across the birth 16 education continuum, especially those in high poverty Latino communities. Prior to joining Helios, uh, uh, Vince served as, a, as executive director for education and public policy at the Arizona Community Foundation, where he oversaw all strategic education grant making as well as public policy initiatives. Vince also served as executive director for the Arizona State Board of Education for nine years. And in that role, he was a chief advocate and policy advisor for issues affecting Arizona's K-12 educational system. Vince holds a bachelor's degree in government and Spanish from the University of Notre Dame and a master's degree in social work from Arizona State University. Vince, thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks, good morning. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about the future of Latino education. Um, but first, I wanna remind our viewers and our listeners, uh, please send in your questions. Uh, we will try to get to as many of them as possible. I know you have questions about school opening and um, how your schools are going to deal with a pandemic that looks like is going to be here to stay for a bit longer. And um, in fact, well, let me just start with that. And I wanna ask Kathy first, um, ma'am, how are the schools uh, preparation for um, the fall? Yeah, our schools are well underway with their planning and to get ready for the next academic year. You know, I, I actually don't say get ready for the fall because many of our school districts start in late July, early August. So really the beginning of the school year is right around the corner. Uh, we released our roadmap this past last week's uh, Monday to provide a lot of recommendations and considerations for our schools as they get ready to reopen. Um, within that 
within that roadmap, we had a, a pretty big section on public health considerations that are aligned with the CDC recommendations. And we had close partnership with the Department of Health Services to put together those recommendations. But a lot of the a lot of the decisions will ultimately be made by, at the district level or at the charter school governing board level. And so we, we did intend for that roadmap to be very adaptable and flexible for our schools to make decisions that were best for their own communities. And so I know that many of our school leaders have been engaging with their communities, sending out surveys, asking families what, what they intend to do, what, they, what their preferences would be, and also reaching out hopefully to their staff and teachers to learn more about what, what more can the school do to make sure that also the staff and the teachers and all the educators feel comfortable coming back in the next academic year. So there's a lot of work to do, but really pleased that we had such great collaboration from across the state to help us put together this roadmap and, and supporting documents for considerations. Uh, do we have any idea how the schools are actually going to reopen? Uh, how many are going to fiscally open the classrooms? How many will um, try and maintain the, a distance learning program? Um, how many will try and open first and then maybe at some point either, you know, um, uh, cancel the classes if, the, if it becomes necessary, if we see another spike, uh, you know, a second wave, for example, of COVID-19? I'm hearing examples of all of the above that you just mentioned that they're, by and large, most of our schools are planning to open and, and have that in-person instruction continue, but many of them are also interested in expanding their online and distance learning opportunities for their students. We have to keep in mind that we have a quite a large population in Arizona where for many of our students th that school is the safest place for them to be where they where they get their meals, where they you know if their parents are at work, we want them to have adult supervision for, especially for our little ones. So thinking about schools as, as, as a very safe place and also the best learning experience in many cases, um, but that said, there are still some areas in the state where there's um, still a lot of COVID cases. And, and so there could be cases of schools that are not ready to open in the next academic year, or some of our school leaders are planning that they may open and then there, there could be a situation where they need to close. So I think our recommendation statewide is to be prepared for all scenarios, to be prepared for in person, to be prepared for hybrid, to be prepared for intermittent school closures, but we're, um, by and large, we're hoping that schools can open at the beginning of the next academic year, but we're going to continue to monitor that data and ultimately the decision will fall with the local governing boards and in conjunction with their local county health officials as well to determine if, if, if in fact it's, um, if it's recommended to open. Vince, you get uh, you get young kids, um, and I wonder: uh, do uh, any of them uh, go to? Um, um, does any one of them go to um, uh, uh, either a, a, a K twelve system? Yes. Uh, so um, I have a three and a, and a five year old. Um, you know, this last year they were actually both in in a preschool through Gilbert Public Schools, um, and uh, my daughter is enrolled at Gilbert Elementary in the dual language program there this, this coming school year. So um, yeah, we've had, uh, the school district has reached out to, I think all of the families in the, in, in uh, the district to, uh, to sort of survey, you know, where parents are at. Um, you know, they've asked questions about, you know, comfort level going back to school uh, in the fall, sort of in the traditional sense uh, to, you know, whether parents are in favor of hybrid approaches uh, and, and, and then also, I mean, whether um, parents plan on, enrolling their kids in the fall um, at all. So, I mean, it's... Uh, what's you know, your comfort level? I, I, what's your comfort level in so far as sending your kids back yeah, to, I mean, uh, physically back to school at this point? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, as a parent, obviously, you know, you're, you're concerned about, you know, the health of your children. So um, I, I, um, I, I worry, um, you know, about, you know, what the situation on the ground will be like, uh, you know, in, in the fall, in the start of the fall semester. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm really encouraged by at least the conversations I've had. I've read the roadmap. I think it's a great framework for what schools should need to be thinking about. Um, I see school leaders and teachers thinking through, you know, the, all of the safety precautions uh, and trying to create as safe an environment as possible for students when, when they return. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, 
I'm planning to, to send our, our daughter on to kindergarten in, in the fall. We are planning to do that. Um, but, you know, we, we certainly worry and, and um, I, I appreciate all the thought that's going into looking at different models for, you know, how to uh, distance kids as much as possible and as much as that's practical, um, you know, to all of the, you know, the keeping the facilities clean and uh, disinfecting surfaces and all of those types of things. Um, but, you know, certainly as a parent, you know, I think every parent uh, to some extent has, has concerns about, you know, what uh, the environment's going to look like in the fall. Right. And uh, I, I want to, Stephanie, is this what you're hearing as well from, from you know, you've done some outreach, uh, pretty inten intensive ones um, in the last couple of weeks. Is this what you're hearing from the parents as well, as well as the students? Um, you know, I think notably in the Latino community, but just generally speaking. Certainly. Absolutely. Yeah, parents are, are definitely concerned about what the future holds for their child's education. That was one of the questions that we asked them. But really, you know, we, we were targeting uh, predominantly Spanish speaking uh, families and uh, some of the families that we sp spoke to, unfortunately, had not heard from their uh, school community at all until uh, we had a live phone, phone bank and a partnership, a media partnership with uh, Univision. And that was the extent of the outreach that they um, finally, uh, where they finally were able to speak to a live person. Um, so in, in all of this, I think communication is absolutely, absolutely critical to all families, um, keeping them informed about what, what the future plans are, um, but especially to our, our Spanish speaking families, um, making sure that we don't forget uh, that we have to uh, communicate with them effectively as well, because they do uh, often tend to get lost in the shuffle and, um, and you know, that's when we start seeing kids start falling through the cracks. So Stephanie, when you mentioned that um, some of them or many of them have not heard uh, communications from their schools, uh, any idea why that's the case? Um, you know, it, it could be any number of things. Um, everything from, you know, some of these parents may have lost jobs and they didn't have a cell phone uh, ability to pay the cell phone that the school had. Um, so they may have, we heard also from uh, from some uh, schools who had heard that uh, when everything kind of shut down, um, families felt safer kind of going back to, to their country of origin, often Mexico, um, to go back and, and kind of hunker down with family back there. And, and that's where they felt um, safe and secure. And so they, they left the country for, for a, a few months. Um, or a few weeks. And so any number of stories were, were things that we heard, but certainly the, the you know, keeping track and, and monitoring current contact information for the parent, for an emergency contact is absolutely critical. Um, now more than ever, of course, um, it should be something that we're doing, but, but now more than ever, just keeping all of that contact information up to date. The other thing too is just thinking outside of the box in traditional forms of outreach. One of the things we um, uh, outreach to families over five different platforms. So we did, you know, we did Zoom and Facebook Live, but knowing that, you know, not a lot of families have access to Wi-Fi. And so we also attempted to use um, uh, Spanish radio, um, Spanish television, and then we did a live phone bank as well. And so just multiple platforms of communication and outreach um, were our strategies to, to reach out to families. And we were able to hear from um, nearly 200 uh, parents and educators on, on this issue. Um, Dr. Trujillo, I want to bring you in, sir. Um, how, so, you know, you're on the ground. Yeah. You're, you're, um, you saw the guidance from uh, uh, Superintendent, uh, Superintendent Hoffman's office. Um, can you talk, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, you know, how are your schools exactly going to open? Open, you know, uh, Brendan Hoffman said, maybe let's not call it in the fall. Some schools are opening in July, but how is that looking like for you? Um, a couple questions that I want to go through just real quick. Um, you know, uh, one of the recommendations is to try and do social distancing within a classroom. Well, you know, we are among the highest, we have among the highest uh, teacher to student ratio in the state. How is that going to look like? Um, what about a hybrid uh, a program in which uh, some students are learning in the school and some students are le learning, like, you know, at home? And I guess the the, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you um, is, you know, what happens if a student gets tested for COVID nineteen and then 
uh, it turns out to be positive. Uh, are you going to quarantine the whole classroom, for example? Um, you know, what, what are you looking at? What, what are your plans, sir? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, big, big question. So I think the first thing, and, and Stephanie uh, was, was right on, it all starts with communication. And we're blessed with some really great equity departments. Uh, Tucson Unified has long been a leader in equity work long before I got here. Uh, and I've just been so impressed with the work of our equity departments. We've been working a lot with our Mexican American Student Services Department. They have a pretty strong network of parents in each school that come together and form an advisory board, um, largely Spanish speaking, that are able to communicate with me directly uh, through focus groups to tell me what their experience has been with online learning, what the experience has been with the devices, food service, contact with the school. We have similar structures for our African American parents, our special education parents, and our Native American parents. And that has really been the driver for our ideas on what schools should look like and what we're planning to do. Uh, our parents have been very, very vocal about wanting the option to remain uh, in an online learning environment for fear of this virus, uh, the virus which will not have a vaccine uh, when we return uh, here in the fall. So we're actually building a hybrid system that will allow a portion of our student body to remain 100% online or come back to traditional instruction. And within the traditional instruction model, the only way that we're gonna be able to achieve social distancing inside the classroom is through alternative scheduling, uh, shift scheduling. We're looking at a lot of our larger schools, different shifts of students coming in at different parts of the day to be able to keep class sizes smaller. We're also looking at hybrid scheduling where cohorts of students we'll have maybe two days of live instruction, but then they'll be remotely from home the other three days uh, so that we can switch different cohorts of kids in and out for the live experience. I think really what, what parents and educators need to be prepared for is that sadly there is a give uh, when you are implementing social distance in the classroom. We know how young people learn best is through project-based learning and cooperative learning structures where students work together in teams very closely. Uh, they work together with partners to facilitate projects. And sadly, when you are implementing social distancing in the classroom, you're kind of returning the classroom to another place in time that we've tried to get away from. Kids seated, looking directly at the front of the classroom, away from each other, keeping space between everybody. Teacher facilitates everything. And, and that, that's something that I've been communicating uh, to our teachers, to our employee associations, and also our parents, that school's going to look different for a little bit uh, in, in terms of how we're trying to keep kids safe and trying to give them the in-classroom experience again. It's not going to be what we had before, and I think everybody needs to be ready for that change. I want to ask you about social distancing and the whole idea that, you know, a kid sits in the in the uh in the in the chair and looks at the teacher and the teacher kinds of provides kind of a lecture form of a of a of a of a delivery of, of teaching right yes how is it really feasible for you know nine year old kids and ten year old kids to kind of just stay in their in their uh, in their chairs I can tell you in my experience my kids probably not gonna do that right it's uh, in, and maybe Vince um, can weigh in on this one but it's really hard to keep kids kind of to themselves, right? Because especially in their classroom setting, if they're going out into the playground, if they're going to eat, you know, at the cafeteria, I, I do wonder just real quick, sir, how are you going to manage all these children and try to keep them, uh, you know, try to maintain socially, uh, social distancing among them? This is probably going to be one of the most difficult, difficult endeavors for us, especially at K3. We have spent years here in Tucson Unified building an exceptional balanced literacy program where if you walk into any K3 environment, you're going to see whole group instruction, small group instruction led by the teacher, students reading to each other, students reading to self in literacy centers where they're working in either partners or triads, groups of three teacher leading small group instruction, guided reading lessons with four or five students around the table. We spent years building this infrastructure, a collaborative infrastructure with students engaging in literacy together in teams. And we're gonna to have to strip all that down 
And, wow. and that's going to be very, very difficult because that's how students learn reading best. That's how literacy flourishes is when you have the environment where students are working with each other and it's collaborative um, and collaborative structures and centers are a part of your literacy instruction. We're going to have to return and it's going to be very, very difficult because our kindergarten through third graders are used to this routine. They're used to this environment. They're used to their literacy centers and they're going to have to come in and get used to a whole new way of instruction. And you're right, it's going to be very, very difficult uh, to get students, especially younger children, to keep that distance between them and their, um, and their classmates. So, so I want to shift real quick to um, uh, access to the tools and the technology that we need uh, as we deal with this pandemic, but even beyond you know, this pandemic. And I want to ask Stephanie, because Stephanie, all in education went to the communities. You talked to the parents um, and you um, found out, I think, some things that we kind of suspected, but you kind of validated it for your, for your outreach. Um, you know, can you tell us what you found out in terms of um, uh, how Latino families, Latino kids uh, are able or unable to access uh, you know, an online platform, for example, because they may or may not have computers or they may or may not have an internet or a, a Wi-Fi hotspot. Yeah. So second to, to lack of communication was the, the technology issues that we heard um, in our outreach as the top concerns from families. So lack of access to, to, to an actual device, lack of access to Wi-Fi, uh, the digital divide was definitely validated in the conversations that we held. Um, but beyond that, the other thing I think that was a little more surprising to me um, in these conversations was that it wasn't just about access, but about also navigating the actual tools and resources, right? So uh, we heard from parents, I'm super, super grateful, like my school community was able to provide access to a laptop, but Unfortunately, I don't have the technical skills to navigate this computer or the actual software platform that my child is learning on. Therefore, I cannot continue to support, uh, you know, I can't support their, their um, distance learning. Um, so that technical skill set, um, parents were asking, uh, part of the, the takeaway for us is parents need additional supports to be essentially instructional support specialists at home, right? We're asking them to be teachers uh, away from the classroom, uh, but not giving them the, the, the tools that they need to be successful in that. Yeah, and you have to uh, homeschool full-time and, and then work full-time for, for many parents. Certainly, and that was, a, that was a, the concern that we heard, that they don't feel, um, they don't feel equipped to do so. Um, so that, that should be something that we should uh, be solving for moving forward. How do we support parents um, as they are, as they're homeschooling or providing instructional support from home? Um, it, it, that, that was uh, one of the, the tech issues as well. So, so let me ask you, uh, Superintendent Hoffman, ma'am, last time we were in a morning scoop, you know, we talked about how ensuring that all the kids, all the families actually have a, a, a access to an online platform, right? If that's how their schools are delivering uh, their education. Uh, that means really a computer and then Wi-Fi connection. Can you update us? Uh, where are we on, on that one? Are all our kids now have a, a, a computer and, and Wi-Fi connection? Oh, I wish that or were the internet case. Connection? <laughs> I, w I wish that were the case, Luigi. So the update, we have a little more data at this point since last time we spoke. So we now estimate that it's about 200,000 students across Arizona that do not have internet at home. So I know in some parts of the state- Did you just say 200,000? Yes, 200,000 wow, okay. without internet at home is the estimate. And so yes, as, we, as we've heard, you know, schools can buy laptops, but what good are they if they go home and they don't have internet or they don't, or the family doesn't have the, the technology skills. We've also heard about teachers that don't have the technology skills and have also been struggling through this learning curve of learning a whole new platform and trying to figure out how to transform their vibrant classrooms into now an online learning platform in a completely different manner. It's one thing to teach online, but, but how do you measure learning and how do you know that your, your instruction is effective through these online platforms? So there's still a lot of issues that we need to be working through when it comes to both the digital divide, but also best practices around online instruction and how we're measuring learning, how we're making sure families 
know how to use the technology that's provided to them and that they have access to internet. Um, so I'm convening a technology task force to address the, many of these issues. Stephanie's actually gonna be on the task force as one of our members and we're launching with our first meeting tomorrow. And that's cool. gonna be made up of um, educators as well as people from the community, but also individuals from the tech industry across the state that are gonna be helping us move forward on these issues. So what's the, uh, what's the time frame for uh, actually getting something out of the committee, which I uh, can assume they're going to have some recommendations at some point. So what's the time frame? We're looking at a very short, a very truncated time frame between, you know, your committee and potential recommendations uh, in the context that, you know, some of school, our schools are opening, you know, next month. So it depends on the objective in terms of how quickly we can get things done. But one of the first things we plan to look at is that the state is receiving CARES Act stimulus funding that our department, as well as um, we're partnering with the governor's team in looking at how to best allocate the funding that is specific to K-12 education. And so that's gonna be one of our first topics of discussion with the technology task force is for recommendations on how to, how to most effectively spend our CARES Act funding from the education standpoint and then what can the tech industry, the private industry side do to either match those funds or help make, we, we wanna make sure we're not duplicating efforts. We wanna make sure that we're hitting the areas of highest need first. So um, that's gonna be one of our first areas to work through. So I think that that's something we can accomplish fairly quickly because we're looking at how to allocate those dollars this summer. So, so um, I wanna remind our um, audience, our listeners and our viewers, um, please do send in your questions. I, we are seeing some of your questions already, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, I want to ask Vince about some of the data that Helios Education Foundation has put out on uh, Latino uh, students. Um, you know, beyond, during, before, during, and after this pandemic, we are going to be facing some lingering issues uh, in terms, for example, of the achievement gap. Uh, between uh, Latino students and uh, their peers, right? So we know, for example, that in uh, reading proficiency proficiency at fourth grade, um, you know, eight the, the numbers are 18% for Latino uh, students and then 44% for white students. Uh, and so far as graduation rates, um, it's 70% for Latino students and 82% for white students. And then in so far as having an associate degree or higher, it's 19% for Latinos and 39% for, for whites. Can, you know, I know Helios Education Foundation, one of its focus is um, on, on um, uh, really trying to see how we can improve education in this area. Talk to us about, um, but, and by the way, let me back up a bit. It's not all bad news, right? Because we are seeing the achievement, map, achievement gap actually narrow. It's, it's just that the gap remains. Um, I wanna ask Vince, um, how much of this is, how much of this has to do with the econom economics of the family vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, let's say, for example, race? Um, well, I would say that um, poverty has always been the number one uh, indicator of, of, of student success. Uh, and certainly disproportionately, uh, a lot of Latino families um, are, are living in, in, in poverty. I, there are a lot of reasons, I think, for the numbers um, that uh, that you highlighted, and I think it, it, you know when we have conversations like this, a, a lot of times people are you know look for well, you know what is the reason and what's the one you know policy solution that's going to fix this, you know, and the reality is it's 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 everything. It, it, it's it's how our students and families engage with the education system itself, um, and so it it is about how we teach language acquisition. It is about um, our accountability systems and how they incentivize schools to take action specifically around achievement gap. Um, it is about, you know, how we overall fund our schools. It, it, it's, it's about the entire array of, of, of issues within the system. Um, and I think what, what we all need to do as, as educators, as school leaders, um, is we need to be really intentional about um, thinking about what, how what we do impacts all of those achievement gaps for Latino students and for all students that are experiencing achievement gaps. And so, you know, I think the, the, the situation with the pandemic and the conversation we're having, I mean, I think it's, it's a good illustration of, 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 of what, I'm, what I'm talking about. So as schools are really forced 
to go into a hybrid model or an online model. Um, you know, we need to be thinking about as, as advocates, as school leaders, we need to be thinking about how those changes and how that shift um, are going to impact low income and minority students specifically, because those are where the achievement gaps exist. Uh, and I think Superintendent Hoffman, from you know the moment this happened, uh, I think very rightly pointed out that you know this is going to be a huge challenge in terms of uh, and a disproportionate impact on 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 Latino students, on um, low income students, um, on all students uh, that that don't have the type of access that's going to be required. And so, you know, as we as we make these decisions, um, you know, we need to be intentional. We need to think about um, the achievement gaps uh, and how the decisions we make are, are going to impact those students for issues related to the pandemic and all of those issues uh, of those other issues that uh, I mentioned and many, many more. So I, I can tell you, for example, that in my case, you know, I'm homeschooling full time and then I'm, I'm working full time. I, my, my kid and I really struggled like the first couple of weeks. And I think uh, my kid is now nine years old, um, uh, sort of caught on like right at the uh, right at the end of the school year. But uh, but it's probably safe to say that um, you know academically and in terms of standards uh, he has been set back um, because he just struggled and I struggled and you know having to immediately shift to being a teacher uh, kind of a full time teacher and and while at the same time working at home which by the way working at home means you're always working all the time right so uh, and and so I want I do want to ask uh, Superintendent Hoffman about just the um, you know, fears that we're, we've set back our kids, um, that the standards are, have not been as rigorous, but especially for our Latino children. Like, um, are you seeing anecdotes of that? Are you seeing any data at all that, um, that would point to, yeah, there has been some setback in terms of um, standards and uh, academic uh, rigors? Well, we don't have a lot of data at this point because we didn't do state testing in the spring. So that would have been the easiest way to measure statewide exactly what the achievement gaps are at this point. So what we're recommending for, you know, as school starts for the next school year is just like our, just, just like any other school year, what our teachers do best is when they get their new class of students, they start to determine who, you know, they start to take data. You need to, you need to have really good data collection on where are my students at in reading, writing, and math, and start to take that data so that you can make sure you're meeting the students where they're at. Um, I, I know we're very concerned with the access to technology being one of the biggest issues. This, techno this digital divide is going to ultimately be one of the biggest setbacks for our, our especially our low-income students who don't have the same access because we know just from research that handing a kid a packet and saying, here you go, do this packet of learning, it's not the same as being in a classroom with a teacher, you know, those pro that project-based learning that Dr. Trujillo mentioned, having that type of engaging learning is so much more effective and meaningful to kids rather than doing a packet at home. And we have a lot of kids across the state that are just doing packets at home. And, and that's just not best practice. So ultimately, we, we, have a, we know there's going to be some catch-up to do in the next academic year. And we just want to make sure we're not being punitive to our students or schools as we move forward. This is not the kids' fault that they didn't have the same access to resources or the same access to educational opportunities. So we need to be thinking about this in a, in a way that's equitable and fair and making sure that when we're allocating the resources that are, for example, the CARES Act resources, we need to make sure that they're getting to, to the students in need. So, Dr. Trujillo, I want to ask you about, uh, you know, what Stephanie's found out through her group's uh, outreach with the uh, Latino communities. I, I wonder if you're if you're seeing that validated in your experience, meaning to say that, um, you know, we have um, Latino families and Latino students in terms of um, maybe not being able to, uh, you know, they might have the computers, but uh, there's no uh, support service for them necessarily. You know, they call and they're not necessarily, there's a language barrier, perhaps. I, I do wonder if you're seeing all these things and how are you overcoming them? Yeah, when, when I look at Stephanie's work, I mean, the biggest, the biggest trend in identified in, in their focus groups matched exactly the biggest trend in ours. And it was the technology piece and the support services piece in terms of how does a parent turn into this instructional specialist that can support learning at home. We were one of the districts that 
we did not hesitate. Um, I had a board that uh, I met with immediately when we were shut down on the 16th, and we made a decision together that we were not going to be okay with 17,000 families cut off from the internet and having no devices. And so we rushed every available dollar uh, from our budget into the immediate purchase of laptops. And naively, we just thought we were done. <laughs> we, we thought, okay, we're going to get all these laptops purchased. We're going to get them imaged. We're going to get them deployed. We were feeling good about ourselves. And uh, then we started very quickly discovering the problems in the home. Uh, in terms of parents not knowing how to support these devices, not knowing how to navigate these devices, having multiple school-aged kids inside the home and only one device, and several teachers trying to get a hold of their kids, having language barriers. Um, uh, Tucson Unified, we have one of the largest refugee populations in the state, and so we have almost 100 different languages in the district. So we've got Arabic, we've got Kurundi, we've got Sudanese, we've got Spanish. And so trying to figure all this out uh, for us was, was a big learning. And so this, this year, we're going to get it right. We're going to have a stronger, more accessible infrastructure for training for parents. And that's something we're going to dedicate ourselves to because that's, that's what we've heard in focus group after focus group with our parents is the device doesn't solve all the problems. And then what we've also heard is internet access has been a tremendous challenge. Uh, either in dead spots around the district. Uh, we have a, a fairly large uh, reservation for the Pasquayaki Nation that we serve uh, as their public schools of choice uh, out by the casino area that has vast amounts of dead spots for the internet that even if we want to pay, even if we want to provide those households, the infrastructure is not up out there. And so it's very, very difficult to get uh, internet connectivity to those areas of the district. We also have a lot of areas of our district that are highly impoverished that are only counting on the free internet access that, that we were able to provide through a partnership with Cox. What we've learned is that the free internet access is not unlimited data. So there's a lot of problems with connectivity, kids getting booted off of our online learning software. So what we're doing this year with our budget, we're just gonna build in high-speed internet for every kid in the district that, that needs it and just view it as a utility bill. I mean, it's just something that we have to do. So uh, I'm sorry, you're saying that you're actually gonna take on the, the, the utility bill for some of your uh, students. We're, we're gonna take on the high-speed internet bill and just treat it like one of our normal utility bills for the district. And it's just something that every kid has to have. Uh, and we, we don't want the internet access to become a barrier. So those have been two really big learnings for us. And if there's any districts out there attending, learn from us. And it's probably better to go slower to be a little bit more effective because rushing a ton of devices out there without that infrastructure behind it, it can be problematic and it can be overwhelming for the parents. So, so I, I, I wanna ask Vince um, as well as Stephanie, um, you know, going into the classes in July and I wonder, what your confidence level is in terms of our educational system actually being able to deliver um, the you know educational needs yeah, in terms of not just the uh, not just the education programs themselves right but also in terms of technical support in terms of the computers you know the Wi-Fi the internet problems I think those are really the fundamental problems that I think a lot face but let me start with uh, with uh, with Vince I think what I think we need to put everything a little bit into perspective too. So we have huge challenges. I mean, superintendent talked about, you know, 200,000 families not um, having even access to the internet. You know, Dr. Trujillo was talking about, you know, access to devices, you know, you put those things together. So, you know, we're talking about a huge portion of, of our K-12 population, right? I mean, that's, it's more than 20%. Sure. When you put those things together, at least, at least, and we don't really know the scale. So, um, so we have this huge challenge in front of us. And we're asking schools to do this, uh, you know, over a summer. Um, so um, this is going to be challenging. And, and I think um, we need to, to understand there are going to be a lot of bumps uh, along the way. And we need to do everything we can uh, to try to help make this transition um, as, as smooth as we can. Um, I, 
I think that um, there, there are going to be challenges, particularly with the, the younger students uh, in terms of the online model. Um, you know, it, it's, um, I, I think, uh, a, a little bit different, obviously, of, of a learning dynamic. Um, we need to also, I think, consider, and we haven't really talked about it, um, but we're, we're, we should not assume that just because we get the infrastructure and the access in place, you know, assuming we do that, that learning will go smoothly. I mean, we're also asking teachers to sort of redefine, you know, how they provide instructions to students and to do that in a hybrid model. And, and we need to make sure that, you know, we consider how um, we provide teachers, you know, with the, with the PD they need so that they can do all of that effectively. So, um, you know, I, I want to be realistic. I mean, we're, I think we're all doing, you know, everyone is doing the best um, that we can in a very difficult time. Um, but I think realistically, I mean, we should expect there are going to be some significant challenges when students return to class, uh, you know, in the fall or, or even, you know, obviously in, in, in the summer. Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, certainly. So I, let me start off by saying that I, um, we, we keep having this conversation about, do we want to go back to normal? Can we just go back to normal? And the reality is that, is that I don't want to go back to normal because normal didn't work for our kids. It just didn't. Um, that what this pandemic did is it exposed the inequities that already existed in the system for over two decades. Um, the you know five shoes report came out when I was a high school senior, and that report talked about the the Latino achievement gap in 2001, and that that was an urgent pressing need that the state needed to address because if it didn't address it, we were going to have economic distress and failure. And that was back in 2001. I was a high school senior. Um, and so it, the, the old way wasn't working for, for low-income families of color. Um, so I want us to take this opportunity to innovate, to create a system that is inclusive and welcoming of all students, that, that is really um, pushing to create um, and invest in in low-income communities of color who are struggling already as it is before COVID. Um, and I think what it's going to take is, um, is, looking, at, um, is looking at how, how do lawmakers support our system leaders? Like Vince said, we're asking sis the school system to do a lot. We're asking the school system to be a social service agency for kids and families in need. And so how can lawmakers and policymakers really come together to support our system leaders in a way that gives them the tools that they need to be successful? And I, I think what we have heard from Dr. Tru Trujillo, uh, Dr. Guestin at Phoenix Union, Gina Thompson in Yuma Union, um, is that they need flexibility they desperately, desperately need flexibility from restrictive policies that are tying their hands behind their backs. Um, and so how, how, can we, how can we get creative? Let's use this time to get creative because the old way of thinking was not working for our kids and we really, really need to think outside of the box moving forward. So I wanna to get to some of the questions, right? You talk, Stephanie, you talk about flexibility. In fact, one of the questions here um, from James, um, he asks, uh, districts are planning for multiple scenarios for conducting school, but some of these scenarios will require, require flexibility in regard to me measuring ADM, that's the average daily membership count and student attendance. Um, what is the policy outlook on timeline in this arena? I, I think I'm going to ask uh, Superintendent Hoffman. I think if I can refine the question, right, there's a hundred day ADM count and that's how the schools are funded. There's a fear that uh, maybe 20% of the students you know, around that area, don't actually show up physically, right? So, so what's the policy outlook there? We're at this point, I'm feeling um, cautiously optimistic about the budget outlook for our public school system in Arizona. I've been meeting personally regularly with our state lawmakers, working closely with Governor Ducey's team and making sure they're very aware of this issue that if, if we look ahead and the biggest fear is that if we have 20 or 30% of students who would prefer to learn from home or for any given reason or don't show up and are not enrolled in their typical school, that would be a massive, massive budget cut to the school because it so, heav it so heavily relies on student enrollment. So we're working with our school finance team 
part of our roadmap was we, we had a, a subcommittee focused on the school finance issue, so they put together recommendations. So we're, we're already actively working on this. Um, I wish I had a more clear timeline because I know time is of the essence and this is, these are, we needed that stability yesterday for our schools to be able to plan for the next academic year. But I, I've been reiterating to our school leaders that we are very actively working on this and trying to push this forward as quickly as possible. This will need le legislative approval. This will need a legislative change, correct? Yes, there's pieces of it that we can do with our school finance team and with the State Board of Education. So we're, we're addressing those pieces that we can address internally, but there are pieces that need to be addressed legislatively as well. So um, here's another question. I think it's specific to you, uh, Superintendent Hoffman. Uh, what percentage of the student population um, I'm sorry, it's, it's, uh, he was asking, Rodrigo is asking, what's the percentage of 200,000 students that don't have access to uh, maybe computer or, or, or internet? And I think, you know, we have 1 million students, so it's like 20%, right? Yeah, we have 1.1 million. Yep. So um, here's one question from Eric. As a member of the tech industry in Arizona, how can we help advocate for this effort or connect our companies with the task force? Uh, we are here to help and support through our communications team, communications at azed.gov for, for any, if, if anyone wants to get involved in any type of our committees or task forces, that's a good way um, to, to express your interest in getting involved. We have our first meeting tomorrow, so we already have selected the task force members for this particular group. Um, and we, we were careful of making sure we had good representation from all, all across the state, all different indus tech industries that we felt would be most beneficial for moving this work forward quickly. Or I guess you can also just tweet Kathy, right? Um, yeah, you can, you can tweet yeah, social yeah. media. Yep. Any of those um, work. Um, so here's a question from Rebecca. Are there any measures that will be taken when school is back in session that will address the learning gap or give more support to the students that didn't have a device, internet, or parents that had language, that had a language barrier? I'm not sure if this question is for uh, Superintendent Hoffman or for Stephanie. I, I can yeah. I can take a quick stab and then let yeah. others jump in as well, because I know one of the other, other questions was how much CARES Act funding is Arizona getting, and I think this is very relevant. So um, as, as a state for K-12 education, we're getting $277 million. The majority of that goes straight out to our, all of our schools. We're making sure that every single school, every single public school in Arizona gets some of that funding. And then um, it, some, some get more than others depending on, on their needs. But then there's a portion of it where there's a, a state set aside. And then there's also a separate fund that the governor's team gets to allocate, which they, um, the governor's fund is $69 million for Arizona's education system. So we have been working to make sure we're addressing this comprehensively. And we're still in the process of setting our priorities to work together on how we're allocating the state set aside funds. But it, it's back to the that other question of thinking about um, how that funding could be used to support making sure there's enough staff in schools and having, for example, having reading specialists or math specialists to help with those types of uh, learning, learning needs. And thinking, of course, about technology, we want to make sure we're looking at broadband internet access across the state as part of how we're spending our state funds. Um, so technology will be a big piece and then thinking about professional development. And so we're still in development of what, exactly how the funding will be spent from the, from the state side, but those are just some of the, the uh, big ideas that we've been working on. So one question, I guess, for Stephanie is that do you envision this task force, and I guess Superintendent Hoffman as well, but let me ask Stephanie to just be specific through the more immediate things that we're facing, you know, lack of access to computers, the internet, um, and, um, and, and I guess issues specifically surrounding those two. Absolutely. I think the, the top two, you know, what we heard from parents um, was lack of access to the actual devices. So lack of access to Wi-Fi um, or excuse me, laptop computers, Chromebooks, et cetera, an actual device and then um, Wi-Fi and connectivity issues. Uh, but then beyond that, I think the task force should really look at the technical skills piece. And um, that was also the, the top, uh, the third concern from parents is that they don't feel readily equipped to navigate whether it's the laptop computer or the actual software program to be the instructional support uh, that their students need at home. And so how do we close that, that skills gap for parents as well? 
Um, here's another question about testing. I think uh, just before we went live, we, you know, we talked about um, testing and the fact that we didn't test this year. I do wonder, um, uh, Superintendent Hoffman and also uh, Dr. Trujillo, what are your recommendations in terms of testing? Are, we, are you gonna push for testing or what does that look like? Go ahead, Dr. Trujillo. <laughs> I would strongly uh, recommend that we waive AZ Merit again this year. And it's, it's kind of part of what Stephanie's statement was, this opportunity to reimagine uh, what public school looks like, what education looks like for students. We didn't have AZ Merit this year and the sky didn't fall, right? So we, we have an opportunity here. We know for a long time that standardized tests don't get a true measure of the work that teachers do with kids or the learning that actually happens in schools. On a practical end of it, because we are dealing with a very serious gap, uh, the loss of the fourth quarter, the loss of nine weeks of instruction, to keep AZ Merit in play for the 2020-2021 school year would be putting the pressure of the teachers to cover five quarters of content in a year that only gives you four quarters, and then to be held accountable by AZ Merit for these five quarters of learning content. It would be insane. Uh, in terms of being able to, uh, that the pressure that would put on our teachers. We're here in Tucson Unified, we're kind of internally redoing our curriculum, we're adjusting it a little bit so that we can build in the standards and the skills that were lost during the fourth quarter of this year. And we wanna pepper them in to the four quarters of the upcoming school year, especially in, in uh, English language arts and math, because we don't wanna create another barrier for parents. And summer academies, weekend academies, after school workshops, that just creates another barrier for parents. Transportation, if they don't have it, they can't go. Work schedules, if they have a prohibitive work schedule, they can't go. So I've been very, very passionate with our team that we will do it within the realm of the school day. So that, that to me is, in, in an ideal situation, uh, AZ Merit should probably be looked at again this year as, as a wave. So are, are there I, any... I'm sorry, could I, I'm sorry, could I go ahead, on that? Because yeah. I, I agree, um, you know, with uh, Dr. Trujillo, and, and I think this is a time to, to reimagine a lot about how we use our accountability systems and all of those things. I do think we need to be very careful, though, um, about not having any measures about how students do on a statewide basis, right? So we were talking about um, achievement gaps. I mean, the, the the only way we're going to know if we're closing achievement gaps, if students are getting served, is if we have some type of measure. I think it's a fair conversation to talk about how we use those data in terms of accountability systems, especially given the current uh, situation to, to Dr. Trujillo's point. Um, at the same time, because I think you know, we, we wanna make sure that we are serving all students, we, we need to have some way to tell you know, how students are doing so that we can use those results to inform our practice and to inform our policy um, to make sure that we're closing um, the achievement gaps. Um, th thank you, Vince. Here's another question. Are there any plans to implement a more widespread COVID-19 testing for students and teachers, or I guess students and staffers uh, upon returning to school uh, to help manage the risk or the spread of the COVID-19? And I think uh, Linda mentioned that tex Texas is mandating this at the college level. Um, uh, your thoughts, I guess, uh, Superintendent Hoffman? We are not mandating that at the state level. And, you know, across the state of Arizona, we have such diverse school communities from our rural schools to our urban big schools, as well as our Native American communities. So when we put together our roadmap, we, again, wanted to be really adaptable, really flexible to meet the unique needs of each community. So I think that the flip side of that, and what we're already hearing in terms of some of the feedback on that, is that while our schools really appreciate having that adaptability and flexibility, that local control, at the same time, it, it can be a challenge when districts are making different decisions that could be even neighboring districts. So you might have one district that's gonna have pretty rigorous screenings, taking temperatures, and then another district could say, we're not gonna, or you know, that's not our priority, but we really feel strongly about wearing masks, so we're gonna go that route. You know, every district's gonna be making different decisions about how they wanna mitigate these risks and, and um, so I think that that could be something I'm anticipating as being a little bit um, uncomfortable for families as they make decisions and they're returning to, in, to if, if they're returning to in-person learning or for our teachers that are returning to teach in person, 
that it can really depend on the district level decisions of how they want to move forward to mitigate the risks. So we know, for example, that Senator Sylvia Allen had tried to um, get some funding for an extension of the classes into the summer this year. And so there's, here's one question. Um, can you extend the school year to catch up or fund summer schools on each camp, ca campus or in pockets for next summer? Uh, what are your thoughts on this one, uh, Dr. Trujillo? Yeah, I think we would uh, certainly, summer school doesn't hurt, but my philosophy has always been using the realm of the school day uh, because that is when we have the students with us. I think anything additive uh, has the potential to create barriers. Uh, I would always, I'm always about trying to find the opportunities, either whether it's an academic intervention or it's a, a socio-emotional support program or it's a compensatory education, making up for lost learning time. How do we build that into the school day? I'm interested in seeing that money uh, if there is a potential funding source and given to districts to create these structures within the realm of the school year and the school day when we have the kids in real time. So um, I, I think we're almost out of time, but I want to ask Stephanie, because Stephanie, you're about to, have you actually released the results of uh, your group's findings? Not, so we will, we'll share out um, publicly today kind of a snapshot of our, of an infographic with, um, with our key findings. Our full report will come out in early July. We're shooting for July 8th uh, with our, our full report and recommendations moving forward um, and kind of our plan for next steps. Um, so be on the lookout for that. I would ask that folks that are joining us today, if they would um, go to allineducation.org slash report. Um, that is where you can sign up to get a, a copy of the full report um, and, and stay, uh, stay looped in with our organization as we continue to evolve this work. But we will we'll definitely be following up. So I'd like to end um, our, our morning scoop uh, with just a quick question and a quick answer about what's the best thing that's happened to you? What's the silver lining for you during this uh, pandemic? Uh, let me start with Vince. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go back to something I said. I mean, I think uh, as I have sort of tried to get an idea of what's happening, talking to to school leaders around the state. I mean, you know, we just we have we have tremendous people working in our schools. We have tremendous leaders working in our schools who have put in um, insane hours to adjust to a very unpredictable environment. So, um, if there's a silver lining, you know, we have we have a lot of of uh, great teachers, great leaders in our schools that are doing their best to make sure that we, uh, we serve our students well. Stephanie? Um, my silver lining is, is really, we heard from some incredible parents. Dr. Trujillo mentioned his parent advisory council in the Mexican American Studies program. I was on a Zoom call with 20 to 30 uh, parents, Spanish speaking moms and dads um, in that Tucson community who are so committed and invested in their kids' academic success. Um, they just need the tools to to navigate the system and to be able to the know how uh, to be advocates for their kids. Um, that was what I'm walking away with. How do we how do we continue to invest in support in, in, in them? Uh, Dr. Trujillo? I think it's the opportunity, even though it's forced by an external uh, agent, the coronavirus, the opportunity to redesign and reform uh, public education. It's here. And um, Sir, Superintendent Hoffman? First, I would echo what everyone else just said. Those were great comments. Um, for me, the silver lining has also been just seeing the phenomenal collaboration that's been taking place, having such bipartisan work happening together. You know, we unan the legislature unanimously passed the school closure bill, which was HB 8910, which helped ensure that there was continuity of pay for our educators and all staff during this time, which was so critical for stability. So I'm. Um, Hopeful to continue to see that collaboration continue at the state level so that we, and I think that there's a greater sense of value for what all the different services that our schools provide. And I, I hopefully will see that also have an impact at the policy level. And to me, the uh, best thing that's happened the last couple of months is I get to spend every day with my kid. You know, it's, it's, been, it's been a real joy and a real blessing just to be with him. Every now and then he'll waltz into my Zoom calls and give me a kiss or, or, or hug me. And that's been, um, you know, I can't ask for anything more than just, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to be a dad to him, uh, but also to be with him, you know, 24 <laughs> seven. Uh, so again, to everybody, thank you so much for joining us this morning.
to our panel members. Thank you for uh, giving up your, you know, giving your time so we can have this discussion. And to our sponsor, All In Education, thank you for engaging this way and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.